So good afternoon, everyone. We now have the privilege to delve into the careers and the experience of our individual prize winners. Unfortunately, today, Kate, who won the Young Ward Professional of the Year Prize for WA, can't join us. She has an excellent excuse. She gave birth to her first child not long after the awards ceremony. So congratulations, Kate. Fair enough that you're not here. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce to you today our winners of the Student Water Prize, uh, as well as the Water Professional of the Year for WA. So first we have Tom, who's won the Student Water Prize for his case study entitled Renewable Energy Reverse Osmosis Desalination in a Small Rural, rural Village in Indonesia. Tom is a dedicated envir environmental engineering student at Murdoch University. He's completed overseas uh, and domestic internships and takes on multiple volunteer opportunities to share his passion for innovative, innovative solutions to environmental problems. Tom's project aims to benefit communities that are facing limited supply, a limited supply of pot potable water. The project that he was involved in uh, provides a detailed optimization of renewable energy through seawater rever reverse osmosis desalination uh, to enable a sustainable water supply that is viable through renewable energy. So we'll explore what that all means. Um, then we have the winner of the WA Professional of the Year, Nick Turner. Uh, Nick is instrumental in the assessment of innovative alternative water su uh, supply options and the strategic development of multiple large water sources for the state. His proudest water achievement uh, embodies his passion and zest for new ideas, uh, exquisitely transforming the groundwater replenishment scheme, which we've already heard a bit about, uh, from an unlikely possibility to the current major drinking water source expansion for Perth. Nick's innate sense of the human psyche, his brightly coloured bow ties on display today, uh, and high regard for community involvement has forged a defiant mark in the water industry, and he's a very deserving recipient of the Water Professional of the Year for WA. So please welcome Tom and Nick. So Tom, time for you guys to talk. Let's start with you. How did you get into the water industry and why? Um, so how I got in the water industry is a bit of a unique story, I guess. Um, I finished high school without having completed any ATAR subjects and no real desire of going to university. Um, instead, I was trying to follow a football dream. Um, I was living down in the country, so moved up to follow that. Um, and about a year in uh, to that uh, dream, I was in quite a serious car accident where um, me and my partner rolled a car and um, was quite severe. Had about 72 staples in my head, 17 stitches, lung cohesion, fractured back. Um, the list probably goes on. Amnesia for a couple of weeks. Um, so I was pretty lucky to still be here, really. Uh, we were driving along. Uh, it was a bit of a corner down near Albany and there was a bit of gravel on the road and um, we started to slide out a little bit and I overcorrected and we actually rolled to the other side of the road and missed an off-duty ambulance by about three seconds um, and then straight down a ditch so we, they said um, if the ambulance wasn't there we, I probably would have bled out of my partner Safra and she would have been alright but obviously we were both traumatised and things. Um, so from that I was really lost. I had absolutely no idea what to do with my life. Um, so I decided to take off on a surfing trip around Indonesia, which my mum wasn't too happy about, <laughs> with my surfboards girlfriend and on a motorbike. Um, it was about three months in when I was in uh, rural Sumatra and um, just talking to a few of the local people and they kept coming up to us saying how much they love Australians. Um, and we had no idea why they were saying that and uh, probably the language barrier didn't really allow us to figure out why they loved Australians. Um, so we ended up coming quite close with one of the guys who uh, was running one of the surf charter boats. He was a local guy and we ended up asking him and he ended up saying about um, when the 2004 tsunami hit Sumatra, uh, Australian engineers were the first people over there to provide water to these people that were obviously so vulnerable at the time and you know didn't know where the next drink of water was coming from um, and so straight away I was inspired and it was almost like it's a bit cheesy but a light bulb moment where I really uh, started to think about what I could do with that um, so I then went to the Mentawis for about 10 days and two weeks later I was in Professor Martin Ander who's here today and I'm sure lots of you know uh, environmental engineering course and um, loving it ever since. Wow, well, yeah. I'm sure you would have made a great football. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> I'm sure you would have made a great footballer, but we're very grateful that, uh, yeah, you had that 
change of life. Um, Me too. Yeah. <laughs> Nick, what about you? How did you get into the water industry? Yeah, there was no car crashes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, I'll go with the why first. I mean, uh, for as long as I can remember, I've, I've just loved water. I grew up sailing dinghies on the Norfolk Broads and I was a rower at school, rowing up and down the river in Bedford where I lived. And I'm a diver, I'm a sailor, I'm, um, I'm a really bad surfer. Um, but it's always been something that I've been really passionate about. Uh, when I left school, I went into chemical engineering, which I worked out after two years wasn't for me. I dropped out, went busking around Europe and America for a year, which is when I realised I did need a degree to get any kind of money out of life, because <laughs> busking wasn't doing it, but I did do a lot of travelling. And then when I came back, I was searching very much the same for what I really wanted to do. And um, the first job I landed was actually selling water treatment chemicals around the Midlands in the UK at a Nottingham University. So lots of Asian guys who wanted tomorrow's products today at yesterday's prices, very smart businessmen. Um, so you learn to do a bit of engagement there. <clears throat> and then I found this leaflet one day at the careers office at Nottingham University for a course in water resources technology at Birmingham University. And when I read that, it's like, that's what I want to do. Um, so with my sales training, I rang them up and they said, oh, applications have closed for the year. And I go, I'll be, I'll be in the area Thursday. <laughs> and I literally drove from Nottingham to Birmingham, which is about a two hour drive and talked my way onto the course. <laughs> um, and one of the ex professors from that course was a guy called David Barnes, who worked for Sinclair Knight in Sydney. And when I landed in Sydney after backpacking through Indo for about four months, um, um, I ran Kinnells, GHD and Sinclair Knight, and it was 89, I think it was, in the Bondi Beach um, wastewater upgrade things were happening right then. So I got offered three jobs in a day, and Sinclair Knight was my place to be, because <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was my kind of environment. So, you know, I just went on from there. Yeah, wow, sounds like that sales experience has uh, stood you in good stead yeah. a few times through your yeah. career. <laughs> Uh, Tom, let's talk about the, your student water prize. So you've won it for an internship that you did uh, in Indonesia. So tell us a bit about that project, how did you get into it and what, what did it consist of? Um, so initially I got into it by showing a bit of interest in Indonesia. I was lucky enough to have Martin Ander as my professor and I went to him and um, he was kind enough to me to take me on a trip, a week long trip during a study week to Indonesia where we got to ex explore some of the innovative uh, technologies around the place um, and it was probably about five days into that trip, at, almost at the end, where we went to a small techno park in Java um, called Barron Techno Park and they had a solar power desalination unit which obviously I was really interested in and why I got into uh, environmental engineering and it hadn't been working for about two years. Um, and so the idea was that this would be supplying a little bit of water to the community. Um, and so with Martin's help, we were able to kind of establish uh, a collaboration between BPPT, who's a company much like Sasira here in Australia, um, and Murdoch University, where I was able to go intern with them for six months. Um, and that pretty much entailed me going over there um, and working on this desalination unit took about three to four weeks and we were able to get it up and running um, and then from there it was more on the optimization side of how we can provide the most um, water with uh, reduced energy costs and um, really try and build a uh, sustainable infrastructure in the small community that we were working in um, and that was that was pretty much it yeah, it's really yeah. Cool. So what were some of the challenges you faced from going to tinkering with this machine to actually getting it running in the community? Yeah, um, so probably the largest one was the language barrier again. Yeah. I um, spoke very little Indonesian and still do, um, but I've learnt a little bit more. And they also, it was quite a rural village, so two hours from the major city. Um, and they usually would speak Javanese to each other, um, which is their local dialect. and then sometimes they'd speak the national language Indonesian which I'd try and teach myself and try and feel in what they're talking about um, but it was also trying to get the mindsets of the people to it's hard when you're in a community that's so desperate for water and you're trying to you know you have a little bit more of a sustainable mind where you're trying to think of the long-term future as well as the everyday future so it was really eye-opening in that case um, we were lucky we had all the resources we needed and that was 
um, great through Murdoch University and then also with Merck Water Solution who they're here today I was able to contact them when I had any problems and they were able to run me through a few things um, but that was yeah pretty much it. That's great. Sounds like good support on the ground. Yeah, and maybe some tran needed. some translators would <laughs> help a bit with that. Yeah, definitely. Um, so one of the things you sort of see, and it seems like this is something you face, is the lack of ongoing maintenance ends up being the pitfall of these projects that they just fall into disrepair and don't get used. Was that something that you addressed in your design, and yeah, how did you manage that issue? Yeah, so it was really quite eye-opening coming from not having too much practical experience. I was lucky that I did a bit of an internship with Merck Water Solutions prior to going over there. I think it was about six months. Um, of working in their workshop so I got a little bit of experience but um, getting over there and realising how um, important it is to work together and really you know drive the concept of collaborative I know everyone else was talking about in their presentation earlier and communication and having that lack of um, communication because of the language barrier was obviously a massive problem. So did you manage to figure out a way to get community ownership so they could continue yeah. to maintain it in an ongoing um, So when way. we first got there, that was probably the first problem that I saw that it was a Japanese company that first implemented this solar power desalination and they pretty much dropped it in and said, good luck, here you go, here's the manuals in Japanese, all the best. <laughs> and so these guys were, did pretty well to have it running, I think, for about six months before yeah. it broke down. Um, and that was the first time it started fouling. Um, and so we really, tr I really tried to work with the people that were there. They also had a desalination person who was quite clued up with the mm. technology, um, so that helped. But then, also on future projects um, like Merck Water Solution, do really try and teach uh, the community so they can completely have that ownership over it, mm. rather than a foreigner coming in saying, "Here you go, this is the technology. Mm -hmm. This is what you need to do. This is you really need." this is how to do it this yeah. is this is your unit we're just here to teach you for this short period of time and then you're the ones that need to sustain it and have that full independence and own, own, ownership over yeah. the unit itself wow so it's really equipping them rather yeah than with all the away. tools that they they yeah. require for the long term yeah fantastic mm. So uh, the plan, from what I understand, is we've developed this in this one community and the idea is to roll that out across a whole bunch of other communities. Um, have you had to adjust the design much for different community needs or is it kind of a one size fits all? Uh, it's definitely changing in every community we go. We've been really lucky. Uh, we went on the new Colombo Plan uh, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade funded our trip with Murdoch University Environmental Engineering students last uh, July it was for a four week, four week trip over there and we, we uh, toured a few different communities and every single community have such different um, desires and what they want, whether some are more economically mindset and then others are just literally want water for their children and mm -hmm. being able to grow. Um, and so it's definitely really, again, collaborating with that community that you're working with and um, working to their exact needs of what they want um, to be able to have a successful project otherwise I know there's like the um, I can't remember the exact name but the projects that were put in Africa the playground pumps I think where they had this great idea of using playgrounds as water pumps um, and it worked in one small village and then they tried to put it all throughout Africa and it didn't work in any others so it's really trying to yeah. fit, fit that for everyone yeah specific yeah. solution for a specific yeah. community so is the pump that you fix, is it is it still working? It's still working. Okay. <laughs> That's always good. How long has it been now? Uh, oh, I, almost a year actually. Oh. Yeah. And so That's last I heard, which was probably a month or two ago, it was still up and running and people were coming to get their water. Oh, that's great. So, that's really good. Yeah. So ongoing, are you still involved in Indonesia? Has further work coming out other than just rolling out across different communities? Yeah, so we're really lucky through Murdoch University, Murk Water Solution, and then a local NGO I'm running, um, Surf Rider Foundation, I run the Perth chapter, and we've been able to collaborate, sorry, with also another local NGO, Bottle for Bottle, um, in a project that we're looking at for a school in Bali, a small island off Bali called Nusa Lembogan. Um, and so how we've all partnered together is Bottle for Bottle at the moment do uh, plastic reduction education in schools in Perth. And they sell water bottles at the end of these programs for about $30 mm -hmm. 
each and that's subsidised for schools over in Indonesia so for every program and every student that graduates and buys a water bottle an equivalent water bottle is given to a kid in Bali and their um, education program is run out with local teachers over there um, and so we've partnered with them in this school in Nusa Lembogan to try and um, use this sustainable technology of providing a sustainable water source whilst trying to eliminate single-use plastic um, so Sorry, a little bit of background on Nusa Lembogan. Um, is So they are a really small island, but really, they used to be seaweed farmers, um, and now the tourist industry has really taken over, so they've got a higher development rate than Bali, which I'm sure everyone's quite familiar with how busy Bali is with tourists. Um, and so they have no regulation on how much water you can take from their ground, and they their main water supplies used to be groundwater and surface water um, from rain. And as the climate begins to dry and more people keep taking water from the ground, uh, salinity intrusion has occurred almost throughout the whole island. Um, so they can no longer use these sources of water and it's causing dramatic problems all over there. For us tourists, it's all right because we can afford the water prices, but for the local people where the water's increased, I think 133% in the last five years, um, they can't, can no longer afford it and so what they're doing is buying small little 220 mil single use plastic cups um, and at this particular school there's 500 children so they're drinking one of those each a day which is, still, which is horrible because it's only 200 mils really for a child um, and then it turns out they're drinking probably 500 mils of coca cola because it's cheaper than water um, so they've got diabetes and losing wow. their teeth and things. So by trying to implement this type of project, uh, we think is pretty perfect mm. um, in the situation where we'll train and um, certify the local operators at the school to maintain and operate the unit, as well as the children on the importance, eliminate single-use plastic from either being burnt or into the ocean uh, or landfill and yeah, give them these reusable water bottles from bottle for bottle, a sustainable water solution from Merck water solution and then Surf Rider kind of just ties it all together. Wow, that's, that's really impressive. <laughs> well, I might have to hear a presentation for you about that in the future, <laughs> give you a few years. Yeah. Uh, Nick, let's talk about you. Tell us about your proudest career moment to date. Uh, well, I guess that was getting ground replenishment from being the crazy idea in the corner to being the next major water source for Perth. To put 15 years into one sentence. <laughs> so yeah, um, um, can we develop on that? I mean, that's well, a long story. Yeah, yeah I'm sure there is a long story. I'll ask a question and you can develop as you want. Yeah. So it sounds like it was a crazy idea. I can imagine there have been a lot of pushback uh, and challenges from inside the water industry and public perception as well. So how did you overcome those challenges to get from vision to reality? Um, well, it, it wasn't just me. It was a, a large mm -hmm. team of people. Well, Varying team, flexibility was a key thing. Um, setting the vision and what you needed to achieve early. So the things that um, um, Sarah and States put up on the wall there, the technical objectives, uh, community buy and stuff and the regulatory impacts. Really early on, I, I set those as requirements. You know, Water Corporation's good at doing technology. I knew that we needed to deliver that regulatory stuff for this thing to ever go anywhere. and. Um, uh, to get sign off at director general level, which is what we needed to get that to happen, that was about a year's work. <laughs> right? wow. uh, Interagency agreement, sign off at DG level, interagency working group to work for the duration to come up with the stuff that needed to happen for this to move forward. Um, I guess think inside the heads of the people that you are dealing with. It's not about what you think, it's about what they think mm -hmm. and what, what they're thinking about now and what you need them to be thinking about into the future and how do you reach that trajectory. And they all kind of, it's kind of fractal art we used to call it, where you, you have a situation that you have and you have a situation that you need to be or you would like to be and you just drop in pebbles in. And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and I guess the other thing is context. So it was necessary, you know, this was, mm -hmm. this was important, except that it doesn't have to happen. This was, you know, we weren't ramming this down. We're not Cape Town. Um, we, we, could ha we could have done something else. So when people have that understanding that this does not have to happen, then you can have a different kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's some of the main things that we would, we would be dealing with. And, yeah, and, and then also sit back and 
watch how the planets are aligning at a certain time and you've got your thinking so you've got various different things that you have where when you see the planets line up you don't know what to go right now that there national water initiative we got i can't i think it was 16 million dollars worth of funding because there was a cost price gap that we were not going to fill with our yeah. current capital program and it was about oh can we afford this once we acquired that funding it's right how are we going to get the rest of the money because we can't not do it you know things like that yeah, no. <coughs> so it, it sounds i mean we're so used to the idea now so it, it's really familiar but um, at the very beginning, how did you how did you actually come up with a this is a solution that you think should go forward? Oh well, it was I didn't come up with it was it was already happening in Orange County in um, oh, okay. in, in uh, California and a fellow called Mike Martin um, who was principal hydrogeologist back then and myself were at a conference in Adelaide and a guy called Bill Mills who was known as the grandfather of the OC scheme came over and gave a presentation about it at that conference and literally Mike and I went for a beer afterwards and I was like. We could do that, and, and, and might be. Oh, I know that, <laughs> but Mike was very technically focused and was doing research sort of around that um, in a f kind of a pretty small circle. It was very technical focused, mm -hmm. and so uh, I used that within the context of you know we're running out of water to sow some seeds for the idea to be considered technically within Water Corporation. So we flew Bill over in 2002 or something like that to have a, uh, a gathering at CSIRO in Florida. <coughs> and um, that, that caused some significant ripples in the Water Corporation. I had people phoning me up. One guy phoned me up and said, if you bring this guy over, I will try and get you sacked. Because what you are doing here is, is, is an anathema to, to safe water. Um, um, and he was, he was passionately of that belief. You know, he was, and that, was, that was the thing, respect how he was thinking, mm -hmm. you know, he wasn't wrong. From where he was sitting, he was perfectly right. Mm -hmm. um, so we got it socialised kind of internally, there was always tension, and then slowly moved that out into a, the realm of the wider public through a set of EPA, or DER as it was back then, workshops that then got a set of strategic advice. That, and you just kind of build that stuff. Mm -hmm. So you're getting more and more currency. And you know, you can always walk away. You know, it's not, it's not compulsory. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so it sounds like you had to, not just at the beginning coming, well, seizing on that idea, but through the whole process, do a lot of complex problem solving uh, about re some really big issues, um, which I can imagine required quite a bit of lateral thinking. How did you, how do you do that? How do you come up with those out-of-the-box solutions to yeah, make something happen? If I knew that, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, you, you won, so I guess... I'm a musician, I'm a key musician. I was I played it last Friday, I was writing a song over the weekend and I'm recording tonight. And and my brain works. So musicians, you are doing something that is deeply technical, that requires a great amount of accomplishment, while at the same time your head is doing this kind of processing thing. You're thinking about the next song, you're thinking about what the person in the third row whether they're listening to you or not. What I'm, you know, it's it is a it's just how my brain works. Mm -hmm. um, Getting that into something that organised enough to actually get a product out, you require you, you surround yourself with the right talent. There, there was two people very early on in GWI, which was Palenque Blair and Vanessa Moscovis. Um, those three dot points, Palenque was the, the deep science, the technical part. Vanessa was the frameworks brain. She's got the best frameworks brain of anyone I've ever come across. And I was the kind of engagement person who also glued it all together. And um, you, yeah, you you work. It's a it's a process is it's imagination and then coming back to that focus of what are we really trying to get to here and how can we change that to keep moving forward or sit still so mm -hmm. the, you know the lateral thing is just that's just what I do <laughs> um, yeah it's um, I don't I don't do linear <laughs> very well <laughs> Sounds like that's worked pretty well for you so yeah. far yeah. <clears throat> um, picking up on that whole engagement side of things you sort of became the public face uh, for water cooperation for during the groundwater replenishment project um, uh, it's a, quite a skill, seemingly, especially for technical people to communicate technical things to the public. Um, did you find that a challenge, or did you have to develop that skill of public communication? Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. So I, I did media training here, um, but it was it was also having done a lot of you know I, when I took my year out from India, I, I stood on a thousand street corners in a hundred cities and made my living out of playing my guitar. And that person walking past, if they gave me a dollar, I could stay there. And if they didn't, I had to go home. <laughs> um, um, lots of experiences like that. Long distance sailing. So I sailed over oceans on square riggers where you were in, in a very small number of people for 100 days, 30 days out of sight of land. You have to understand what is going on inside people's heads and 
how they roll. Um, and when you are on a talkback and you have got a person ringing you up on live radio, he was genuinely scared about what is being proposed there. You respect them, right? Don't blind them with science and tell them that they're stupid and wrong. Um, listen to them. Um, and then roll, right? Adapt with it because a technically, the strongest technical answer isn't going to persuade anybody who isn't in that technical mindset. And most of the thinking around this of people that are that are uncomfortable with it is around emotion, not technical fact. Um, mm -hmm. So you you don't you've you've got to have the conversation in a realm that they are prepared to engage in. So don't blind them with. You know, all the data says and it's perfectly true, Stace. You're right, absolutely right, <laughs> but that's not the way to do it. And the, the other thing is, get the right voice in the room. Like, um, there's a, a, a marvelous guy at the health department who's almost retired now called Richard Lug. Richard and I did years of proactive engagement with the Australian Medical Association, Health Consumers Council, um, all the microbiology associations and stuff, Public Health Association, GPs Association, giving them the information about. Um, what the trial was about. Now that could be quite technical, but mm -hmm. that, that meant that when the community approached them, one, they had the information, and two, you had the story of that. Mm -hmm. We heard a bit about stories. It's, a lot of it's about stories. Mm -hmm. And you don't, you know, you, ah, oh, good example, one night um, we were doing Cancer Council, and Richard Lug, I, I went along as the, the plumber basically there. I, I did very little talking, because they didn't care about the technology. They wanted to know about the health aspect, right? <coughs> and Richard is a highly respected, health person for 30, 40 years. And the guy that was in charge of the Cancer Council also was saying, oh, you know, what do you reckon? You know, you, you guys okay with it? And he goes, what I reckon is if Richard Lug is gonna come here, who I've known for 35 years, and stand up and tell me it's safe, I don't care about the technical content because I trust him, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, so, you know, you get the right people, um, respect your people that you're dealing with, and. Yeah, be tell, flexible. <laughs> tell a story. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds great. So um, you said you've, um, we received, I guess, um, the idea from Orange County, but has the Perth system impact, had in, any impact on other countries in the world? Uh, well, um, simple answer to that is, is yes. In, in that I was lucky enough to win the Gary Mike Scholarship um, last year where I went over to um, um, San Diego, which is just south of um, OC. And then up to the Monterey Conference, uh, which is the, the Water Reuse Conference. That's the, the kind of premier event for recycled water for drinking in North America. Uh, to find out things about direct potable reuse, which is one of my uh, things I'm working on at the moment. And three times at that conference, I saw um, Perth GWR acknowledged in a technical sense, in a engagement sense, and in terms, particularly in terms of deliber delivering the regulatory framework sense as the benchmark, right? Which was pretty cool. That <laughs> was pretty cool. So, um, and, and yeah, you know, when you, you engage with people, they, it, yeah, it, it just is, it's the one where things were done right to get a good outcome. Um, acknowledged everywhere. It's pretty cool. That's, that's amazing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like a 15 years well spent. Yeah. Um. I was doing other stuff as well, but <laughs> yeah, sure, sure you were. Actually, I ran source planning for seven years. That was actually a lot harder. Oh, <laughs> you couldn't, you couldn't fail at that. <laughs> like, the city ran out of water in deep trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, that might, might be a story for another time. Yeah. So, Tom, you graduate from Murdoch University mid next year. What are you working on now? Uh, so, I'm still going ahead with all this new Selenbogen, all this new Selenbogen project. Uh, we find out whether we get the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade Friendship Grant in the next couple of weeks hopefully and from there hopefully can develop that further and continue to work with the community and really set some uh, a timeline where we can implement this efficiently. Um, and then I just started with Josh Byrne and Associates so I'm really enjoying that kind of work. Um, I start my honours pretty much almost now wow. um, and so with Martin Ander hopefully as my supervisor and finding a project and then um, yeah, graduate and see what happens from there. Fair enough. Wow, it sounds like it's going to be a really busy six months for you <laughs> in the next little while. And so you, you're working working on the New Salem Morgan project and doing your thesis at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Get some sleep in there at some <laughs> point. Yeah, I'll try. Get, get some surfing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. that's more the problem. <laughs> and Nick, what about you? What are you working on now? So actually, my main well, the, the direct part of what I've talked about. So I'm just about I'm, I'm just closing out on reporting on that. Um, and 
uh, you know, I've ran source planning for seven years. The minute I stopped running it, it started raining. So we now have lots of water in the dams. Or well, in fact, we, we, we have a very low reliance on the water in the dams. So we need, don't need a new source for a while now, so, which is good, because you don't want to hurry direct paper reefs. Um, <laughs> but the other major part of my work is actually in this water-wise city space. So, and again, it's kind of ironic. Um, while I was running source planning, we delivered second stage of binning up and two stages of GWI. So that's, what is that? It's nearly 80 gig worth of source, right? So that almost took us away from reliance on surface water. Job done, awesome, right? Then I move into this water-wise cities um, um, area and start looking at the gap between the demand and the requirement for non-potable use for irrigation and green spaces through our communities. That is the big challenge this city faces in the next 20 years, right? We are, we're still working with the department to come up with the exact numbers, but that is somewhere between 80 and I'd say about 130 gig of water, right? That's more than our, that's, that's about our total desal capacity, right? So if we're gonna maintain the amenity of this city with the green spaces that we have over the next 20 to 30 years, there is a massive job in getting that to happen, either that, or we are changing our mindset to become more like southern Spain than Surrey, which I kind of, I think we need to move towards that actually. I, 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 went, I wasn't holiday in southern Spain recently and it's, it's a different head, head space, but to find those solutions, so I'm working on uh, lots of different projects at the moment which are looking at much more of that small stuff. Um, interestingly, you know, building big boxes, we're really good at building big boxes, you know, we can do that in big pipes and all that kind of thing, but when you're getting down to that small um, bespoke local solutions that is that is a different level of complexity um but it's a lot of fun <laughs> and it's and it's the next challenge of this city yeah so that's where i'm putting my time yeah mm -hmm. wow. i was going to say direct potable reuse does sound like the the ultimate goal for so for water reuse but it sounds like you're saying that's not the thing that we should be focusing on oh you you, know, you, you want to you don't want to put all your eggs in what you know you, you want to focus on a number of things dpr is is important in the context of new water sources i mean you know at the moment we are work that I do when I was running planning, source planning still, we are looking at getting two desal plants to approvals ready, and we're looking at a small groundwater scheme. GWR is now back on the table because, um, for various reasons I won't go into, um, and when you're looking at that, when, for instance, south of the river, uh, it's, well, being at GWR, the water quality is good, okay? So the water you put in over here, you can pull water out from a confined acre for three k's away that is four or 500 milligrams a litre. Down south, it's 1,600 milligrams a litre, so it's pretty pretty crap water. So, mm -hmm. the context of not putting it in, in, in and using it directly, so that you've got 200 milligrams per litre, is a very strong one. So, mm -hmm. you want to understand whether that is technically a good idea, and then have the same work pre-work that we put in for GWR in place. To, I mean, what is it? The thing I come down to is, would you? Um, does it make sense? No, could you? Um, um, does it make sense? Um, should you? Is it cost effective with the other sources? Mm -hmm. And then, would you? Would you actually put that in front of your government? I've mixed all the choices that we have for our next drinking water source. We're gonna put direct potable reuse as our next source, and we have confidence that it can be done for these reasons. Mm. That's a big call. That's a big call. <laughs> That's a big call. <laughs> well, I'm sure you guys could tell so many more stories, but we are uh, close to time and I'm sure people are ready for a barbecue. So one final question for you, Nick. Uh, you seem to be known for your daring dress sense. So for those daring of us who are in need of some Christmas inspiration, uh, what's your top tip for procuring a brightly coloured bow tie or even some snazzy well, suspenders? Well, actually, this one, go to Monterey, actually. Oh, there, yeah, <laughs> there, there, yeah. So there was, a, there, was a, there was a shop, I live in Fremantle, and, and Monterey's very like Freo, and there was this funky shop that was d doing this closing damn thing. They had all these wacky mirrors and all that sort of stuff. I thought, oh, I want to buy something colour. Bow ties. So I only started wearing the bow ties after I got back from Monterey. But the suspenders, I've um, been wearing through my whole career in... Um, Impulse purchasing. There you go. <laughs> if you see a good one, get it. Don't let it go by. <laughs> okay. There you go. Tips for our Christmas shopping for this year. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to hit these guys up over uh, over the barbecue. But for now, please join me in thanking our WA Student Water Prize winner for the year. And our Water Prize winner of the year, Tom and Nick.